Hello, my name is Artur Skorek and I'm an executive secretary of the European Association of Israel Studies and we are continuing with our series of, of discussions, of interviews, of talks on the important and recently published books related to Israel or Israel Studies. And I have a great pleasure and an honor to host today, Professor Rafael Cohen Almagor. Good evening, Professor. Good evening. Good evening, Artur. Good to see you. Um, Yes, and uh, I will begin with introducing you uh, and please let me have a brief introduction if I would like to cover everything that you probably consume most of our time given for this interview, so a concise version. Um, Professor Rafael Cohen, he obtained his PhD in the political theory at the St. Catherine's College, University of Oxford. And since 2007, he's a professor of politics at the University of Hull. And earlier, he taught also in, in Oxford University, Jerusalem, Haifa, Johns Hopkins University, also near my university in India. <clears throat> he's also a senior fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, and a distinguished visiting professor at University College London. He has started also um, being the public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center of Scholars, and he is looking ahead to being the guest professor at the Olaf Palmer's Lund University, Sweden. And Professor Raphael Cohen is a founder of Israel's second generation of the Holocaust and Heroes Remembers Organization and the University of Haifa Center for Democratic Studies and the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute Medical Ethics Think Tank and the University of Hull Middle East Study Group. And he wrote uh, several books and numerous, numerous papers. His one of the recent books is the Confronting the Internet's Dark Side. And today we will discuss the, the most recent book of his, Just Reasonable Multiculturalism, Liberalist Culture and Coercion. And, um, and the book is uh, on a broad general topic and it has several case studies. I, I will try to focus mainly on the Israel case study as probably this is something most interesting to our subscribers, to our viewers. And uh, currently you are working also on the, professor uh, is working on the new book of his on the Israel-Palestinian conflict. And on the way to uh, publishing this book, he very recently published an interview with the former Prime Minister of Israel, Ehud Olmert, on the peace negotiations that I would also recommend. But now let's uh, move to the, the book of yours, The Just Reasonable Multiculturalism. So first, if you can give us just a, a brief background introduction, what prompted you to write the book? Why you've chosen this cover for the book? To whom it is dedicated? Why? Thank you very much. Uh, these are three very different questions. You need to remind me probably later on if I forget any of them. Uh, I've been writing about multiculturalism for many, many years. I, I actually started my journey in the field of multiculturalism back in 1990 to 1993 when I was a fellow at the Valley Jerusalem Institute. And at that time I was a member of a very interesting group of scholars, a think tank that was looking at the way that uh, the Middle East influenced Europe and the way that uh, the Europe in, was influenced, influenced in the Middle East. Um, and that started my journey in the field and I wrote articles here and there uh, along the years. But I was preoccupied with other issues and uh, uh, didn't think about writing a book about multiculturalism as such. What prompted me to write this specific book was um, a series of statements of the then Prime Minister of, of Britain, David Cameron, who said that uh, multiculturalism has failed in, in the United Kingdom, has failed in Europe, it uh, promotes radicalization and might lead to terrorism. And I thought that this was too much. Um, it was disproportional to multiculturalism and damaging a great deal multiculturalism. 
Because until ta that time, there were two major attacks on multiculturalism, that it's against uh, democracy because it puts too much emphasis on group rights versus individual rights. And that it, it's harming women because most of the time when people pose uh, cultural rights, those that are um, undermined or offended by it uh, happen to be women. And I dealt with these attacks before, but I never dealt with an attack that saw relationship between multiculturalism and terrorism. Mm -hmm. So then and there I decided it's time for me to, to start thinking about, about a book. And the way to push it forward is first to see what I published until then and try to see if there's any coherency between the different articles. And then to just to bring my own thoughts about this and to have, it's one thing to write an article, it's quite different to write a book. To see if there's anything that I can say that is new, that is fresh, uh, that is exciting, uh, whether I can formulate some sort of theory that will um, reconcile between liberalism and multiculturalism. And if the theory that I provide in the book, I call it just reasonable multiculturalism, is a theory that tries to, to do this, the middle ground, the middle way, um, the golden mean, if you like, of Aristotle between multiculturalism and, and liberalism. You asked me about the book cover. Um, it's right behind you. Yeah, that's the book. Um, and you can see the cover. I hope you can recognize uh, the photo. Mm -hmm. The photo is the, the photo of the um, walls surrounding the old city of Jerusalem. For me, this is one of the most beautiful scenes that a person can see. Every time that I happen to be in Jerusalem during dusk time, and I, I witnessed that uh, when all the walls are illuminated, I, I tremble. It, it really touches me. It's so beautiful. But aside of being um, a beautiful scene, I thought that this photo is very, very symbolic. Jerusalem, of course, is a multicultural city. It's a religious city for the three Abrahamic religions. Um, it has a lot of frictions. And it has a lot of unity as well. It's the capital of Israel, the spoiled capital of Palestine. And the whole city um, is surrounded by walls. And the message of the book is that we will try to eradicate the walls and bring channels of communication to build bridges. And if we'll be able to bring, to build enough bridges, then we will see the light. Mm -hmm. So that's why I chose this um, this photo that for me, it's very, very symbolic. Now, I dedicated the book to three people. Um, the first is Yudal Elkanah. Um, Professor Yudal Elkanah was um, a legendary president of the Valle Jerusalem Institute. The Valle Jerusalem Institute is a very well-known uh, research center in Jerusalem. And... Uh, Yuda heard that I'm coming back home from Oxford after four years at Oxford. And one day he called me to my home at Oxford. He got my phone number and invited me to be a fellow and advisor to him at the Valley Jerusalem Institute. So he put the red carpet for me and embraced me and softened the return home, which was difficult after four years at Oxford. Is where there's many things Oxford is not. Um, and for that, I'm you know, in debt for life. But moreover, because it gave me carte blanche to study all the projects at, at Balir and decide for myself which one is the most interesting for me. And I told you that I opted to, uh, to belong to the Europe uh, project that studied the cultural influence between Europe and the, the Middle East. The second person, to whom I dedicate the book is um, Biko Parekh. Aside of the fact that Biko is one of the leaders of multiculturalism in the world, he's also a close friend and he was one of the people I consulted in writing the book. So Biko took upon himself to read each of every chapter of the book and to give comments on each and every chapter of the book. Mm -hmm. And I owe him um, tremendous debt. 
And the third is Will Kimlicka, again, a giant in the field of multiculturalism. Um, Will studied at Oxford before me. And for me, it was always inspiring. I studied with people at Oxford that couldn't, uh, that cared very little about culture. So uh, Ronnie Dworkin, um, Jerry Cohen, um, Jeffrey Marshall, they hardly spoke about culture, which I found amazing, uh, given the fact that I thought cultural and religion are very important in one's life. But this issue was totally ignored. So read, uh, when I read Will, uh, it was like a fresh air for me that uh, as someone who reckons uh, the importance of culture and gives its due weight and, and, and due significance. And later on, when I started my career in, in the field of multiculturalism, Will and I wrote a few articles together, co-authored a few articles together. So he was and remains a very inspirational figure in the field of multiculturalism, not only for the world, but especially for me. And actually later this week, I'm going to participate in a conference in Paris, 25 years to his book on multiculturalism celebrating the book. So uh, these are the three people uh, to whom I dedicated the book and I think they thoroughly deserve it. Thank you and I really envy you for the conference in Paris. Uh, I remember when I was writing my PhD on the religious state relations in Israel, I also used Will Kimlicka, uh, well, the concept and the books. Um, okay, let's let's get let's get to the book and uh, let's get to the basic issues, the theoretical framework that you are using to to consider this well numerous case studies of the conflict between the individual and group rights and when state can intervene in a justified way um, between the groups and the, and the individuals. And your theoretical framework, it is embedded in the very general values ideas as moral rule of law, the reasonableness, the proportionality, suitability of means to ends, the necessity, sensitivity, social acceptability. Mm, so, so do you think it might be a bit problematic that these are so general terms, for example, for the Supreme Courts when they are dealing with their particular cases, uh, are, these, are these values that the principles are clear signposts for them to decide in the particular cases or, or it might be problematic? It's always problematic to try to translate philosophy into law. And uh, my intention is not to serve as a as a guide or guru for the Supreme Courts in the world. I wanted to develop a comprehensive theory uh, of multiculturalism that is also liberal. So when I was coming, and I'm a political scientist, so, so I always try to develop a theory and then apply it to a case study. So that, that's always a framework. Uh, the transfer in all my writings. I always try to, to look at uh, relevant theories or to develop uh, theories of my own. In this case, the starting point was um, thinking about the value that underpin democracy and uh, um, the guide or the, the stepping stone for a, a decent society. For me, the most important value of all the values is justice. Mm -hmm. Some liberals claim or say it is liberty, some others say it's equality, still some others say it's tolerance, others believe it's truth, all kind of freedom, free speech, assembly, and so on. I believe that we'll be able to find a just system, then ipso facto all the other values will be satisfied. So for me, justice is the most important value. And uh, there are many discussions what is justice. So you put 10 people in the room, you probably get 12 answers of what is justice because some of them will be conflicted with themselves. So. Uh, luckily for us, um, a philosopher by the name John Rawls, back in the 1950s, took upon himself the assignment, life assignment, to decipher what justice is. And he dedicated 20 years of his life to study this, actually more because he then wrote other books. But he dedicated 20 years of life of his life to write a theory of justice that came out in 1971. And uh, I'm a Rawlsian. I very much appreciate and like his theory. I think it makes sense. 
So he provided me with, if you like, one leg for the theory to explain what justice is. And then I needed to explain what liberalism is and what democracy is. So that's the first chapter. The second prong or the second leg of the, of the theory has to do, of course, with the concept of multiculturalism. And um, here I am assisted by uh, the concept of visibleness. Again, it's Rawlsian, but also it's Kantian uh, concept. I thought that even if we can't agree on justice, at least we can reconcile to have something that is reasonable. That even if you don't believe in that, there are some practices that we can say it's it's something that we can endorse or it's something that is over the top. It's something that we cannot really live with. So the chapter, the second chapter is about reasonableness and multiculturalism. Um, and that's, if you like, the second leg of, of the theory. The third leg of the, of the theory has to do with how you're going to make the bridges or to find the bridges. And I am a great advocate of the concept of compromise. I believe that it is possible to find a middle way that you can't, we can't live life that is perfect. Mm. Um, we, we have to reconcile, we have to make sacrifices, we have to compromise on certain things. So I'm a big advocate of compromise and think that many of the differences, uh, contradictions, clashes can be resolved if we'd be willing to compromise. And I also, and I believe that a lot of this compromise can be made through deliberation, through argumentation, through debates, um, voicing your opinions, allowing others to voice their opinions, and then to find some sort of a way. So I'm um, inspired by Jürgen Habermas and his ideas of deliberative democracy. And the fourth and last prong of the book, the last leg of the book, has to do with the issue of coercion. We have a, 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 a knee-jerk sort of feeling about coercion. None of us like coercion. But of course, life is full of coercion when you come to think about it. We all abide by the law, whether we like it or not. Um, we all pay taxes, whether we like it or not. We all serve in juries, whether we like it or not. Some of us will go to the army in certain states when it is compulsory, whether we like it or not. We, stand, we send our kids to school at least at the age of 16, whether we like it or not, whether they like it or not. So our life is full of coercion. And of course, if you think that there are times in which the state should intervene in illiberal practices of cultures within liberal democracy, then of course it has to be coercive. And sometimes coercion is justified. And this is why I put the word coercion also in the subtitle of the book, because I think that there's mm -hmm. no way out of um, inflicting coercion when it's deemed reasonable and necessary. Right, and, and continuing with this with this topic, uh, the, the liberal idea is based on state neutrality. Uh, and probably this is also the, mm, the reason for which the state can use coercion. But how would you uh, reply to a member of this conservative closed community who doesn't see the proclaimed neutrality as something that is really universal and justified. He sees it as a liberal oppression. So for example, at schools, when we are teaching about the uh, issues that for us are universal as pluralism, and he treats it just as um, well, teaching to his kid the values of the culture that he opposes, the, the liberal culture, or the example that you've given in your book about the Jehovah Witness, who um, is more focused about the redemption of the soul of his kid and not about his health. So what is the answer of the liberal state to, to these claims? Well, first of all, uh, I disagree yeah. that uh, the liberal state is neutral. I don't think so. Um, I think the liberal state is not neutral. You know, neutrality is in the camp of anti-perfectionism. And I think that by definition, liberal democracy is perfectionist. If you uh, put um, um, in, in the limelight um, the autonomy of the person, and for you, that's the most important thing in liberal democracy, everything stems from the person, everything returns to the person, and the state is just um, a tool, a capsule in order for us to 
accomplish what our, our ends to become who we like to become, uh, to be the people we would like to be, to fulfill ourselves, then it's by definition a perfectionist society. It's not a neutral society because everything is geared for the autonomy of the individual. Um, in that respect, I fully agree with uh, Joseph Raz, again, one of my teachers at Oxford, uh, and his book, The Morality of Freedom. And just, Raz argues that this is just, you know, the claims for neutrality is just a facade, but actually liberal democracy, like any other form of government, is perfectionist by essence. So that's philosophical, if you like, and about terminology. Mm -hmm. When you come to issues, um, the problematic issues like Jehovah Witness, I made, I think, an important distinction. It's not mine, it's not original, but still I think it's important, uh, between self-inflicting harm and other inflicting harm. I think that we can allow more latitude if people would like to harm themselves, especially if they're adults and not vulnerable, um, so they are not under influence of others, and, and they freely decide to harm themselves. I, I, gave an, I gave an example in the book, uh, people who decide to starve themselves to death at some point in their lives. And I said that, you know, we would not like to encourage this. We don't encourage any society would be insane to encourage suicide as a value uh, because then you're left without any people in the society. If everyone will commit suicide, there won't be any people around. But we should appreciate the autonomy of the person to decide his or her own lot, if that's what they want. It's different when you come to decide the lot of another person. So in my book, I gave the example of Abe, who is a Jehovah Witness, and he wants uh, to stop uh, blood transfusion, not for himself, which I have no problem if he wanted to do that, but for his son. And I think this is problematic. And I think that here the, the, the state has to come in and said, well, you can decide it for yourself, but you cannot deprive the right to life to your own son. That's something that we don't believe. It's against the values of medicine. It's against the Hippocratic Oath. You know, medicine is there to help people and to try to redeem their suffering and to provide livelihood rather than death. That's why medicine is invented. And we as a society don't believe that you have as a parent um, an absolute power on your children. You have, of course, influence power of your children, but it has to come within certain boundaries. And on cases of life and death, I think you know life is too important to leave it only to the parents to decide the lot of their own children. Of course, it's a, it's a judgment call. That's my judgment. You can contest it, of course. I, I welcome contestation. That's absolutely fine. But I think this is one of the cases in which we have to balance one against the other, the right of the community to appreciate you know, one's culture, one religion, being Jehovah Witness and the right of the child. And for me, the scale tip on the right of the child. Right. Okay, you've, you've, you've provided us with the structure of the first chapter of the book, the theoretical part. Can you also give a brief outlook about the, the next chapters with the case studies? What were the logic behind this? Oh, yes, of course. So the first, the, the, the book is structured around three parts. The first part is the theoretical, and I mentioned the four chapters uh, of the theoretical part, and then I apply the theory to the rest of the book. So the second part of the book have to do with case studies, and I differentiate between cases that the harm is tangible, physical harm. If I swing my hand and I punch your nose, you're going to bleed. This is noticeable. We can see the blood. It's in your face. Um, it's something that we can reckon with quite easily. And these have to be distinguished with a long-term harm that is not physical. So the next part of the book is about physical and non-physical harm. In the physical harm that for me, I think are clear, let's put it this way, uh, because of the tangible effects that you can see here now, I'm dealing with cases like um, scarring, when you scar yourself or you scar others, um, sati, um, starving yourself to death, murder for family honor, female circumcision, female genital mutilation, and male circumcision. So these are the issues of the first 
part of the applications. And then I apply the theory to examine each and every case and make my judgment call um, in light of the theory. And then I move to the non-physical harm in which I examine cases like um, discrimination against women, either because they married outside of the community or because um, people want to deny them education. I also look at uh, apostates, people who decide to leave the religion or the community and then be discriminated against because they decide to leave the community. And I discuss uh, deprivation of education from vulnerable population like children or women. And I discuss this as well. So that's the second part of the book. The third part of the book has to do with two case studies, country case studies. Remember that what prompted me to write the book was Cameron and the claim that multiculturalism leads to radicalization and even to terrorism. So I decided to take two countries that hold security and public order as a pretense to deny multiculturalism or to restrict multiculturalism. One case is France, in which um, this fear of collapsing the Republic, hurting the Republic, undermine public security, terrorism leads to denial of rights to minority, the Muslim minority. And the French has obsession with the Muslim dress. And I discussed this obsession, I tried to explain it. Where does it stem from? Why, where does it come from? And why France decided to opt to this kind of um, restriction? And the second case that is Israel, that 21% of the Israeli population are Palestinians, Israeli Palestinians. And again, the claims of security and stopping terrorism and civil war leads to discrimination against the Arab minority in Israel. So these are the two cases. I examined both and I reached a similar, very similar conclusion that in both cases, to discriminate on the basis of security and to deny multicultural rights is not justified. Yeah, and, and there are really a, a few interesting, well, uh, several interesting issues and we unfortunately won't have enough time today to, to discuss all of them. So let me just choose some of them. Um, so for example, you, you describe the Amish education in United States and Canada and the American Supreme Court, it supported the white autonomy for the close religious communities as Amish community. And you adopted more strict approach to this issue. So we have, I think, a similar case of the Haredi education in Israel. So in your opinion, what would be the similarities and dissimilarities with these two case studies? And in your opinion, how far should the Israeli state go to intervene in the educational system of this conservative close group? There are similarities between the Amish and the Haredi. Both of them are close communities, strict communities, guided by very orthodox religion and um, mm. deny education. Now in the in the Amish, they deny education to the children. The children usually study in the, until the age of 16 and then they go to work. And they return back to the wherever they are, if they are studying within the Amish community or they study outside of the, community, the Amish community, they study to work and um, the Amish are agricultural community. So farming is very important. And you know that farming uh, is a very difficult work, very difficult job. So they need to, to train them to, to carry this job after the parents. And therefore they see no need for them to continue um, studying the, until the age of 18. And even when they study, it's not at the same level of the surrounding American society or North American society. In Israel, um, very similar in terms of the curriculum, meaning the curriculum is designed to perpetuate the Haredi population. So some subjects are not that important. For instance, science or mathematics are not important in the Haredi population, very similar to the Amish, uh, again. And of course, a lot of emphasis on studying the religion, like in the Amish. The, the Amish is Christian, here mm -hmm. is Judaism. And uh, the result is that uh, there's no comparison between the level of education that Haredi child receives and the level of education that a secular Jew receives in Israel. It's simply worlds apart. 
and therefore you'll find less Haredim in the universities because they would not be able to admit. Now Israel is going out of his way to devise for them special form, special curriculum that they can call to colleges and universities and still have some sort of a higher education. But for many years, they, they have nothing. The problem with the, with the Haredi is even worse than the Amish because they discriminate against women. So the men, of course, can go and study and they die themselves in the tent of Torah because the highest thing that a man, a religious man, a Haredi man can do is to study the Torah. So that they, go, they don't go to university, they go to, to the yeshiva and they, they can spend many, many years there uh, until the 50s, you know, um, you devote your entire life to, to the study of the Torah. It's a command from the Bible. Women are inward looking according to Alaha. So they have to take care of the children, of the home, of the men. They stay at home. And of course, if they stay at home, there's no need for them to pursue any education. And also there's no need for them to study the Torah. It's the men's world. It's not the women's world. So they doubly discriminate. They can't excel in the studies of the Torah and they can't excel in studies as such. And I think this is very, very discriminatory against women. I don't think that we should just continue as nothing happened. We should encourage education. We should try to access these women and provide them with abilities to, to be educated. So I applied the same rationale of, uh, of the state intervention I think one of the roles and the duties of democracy is to assist vulnerable populations. And in the case of the Amish and the case of the Haredi, I think it's the role of the state to, to, to help and to assist and to promote the education of the children and women in these communities. So, so you would claim that the, there should be the curriculum that it's not accepted by the Haredi community, also probably many women from the community, so the internalized coercion that you've mentioned, uh, and, and, and still give it to the Haredi children against the will of their parents? No, 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 not against the will of the parents, but I'm saying that we need to find bridges to them. We, we need to accommodate them. We need to provide them with the abilities to progress if they want to. I'm not uh, in favor of coercing them, you know, uh, coercing them to be free. I'm not Jean-Jacques Rousseau to that extent, no. But if someone wants to, if they, if they have the curiosity, the same for the Amish, if they have the curiosity to study something else, I think that we should help them to find a way that they would be able to educate themselves and to promote themselves and so on. I'm very much against this kind of repressive tradition that sees the role of women only that is restricted to the home. I think it has to be through negotiation, compromises, the will of the husband, the will, the will of the wife. But it cannot be that it's going to be only the will of the husband and there's no will to the wife. I think it's unfair. And we need to find ways for them to accommodate them and to enable them to find themselves, develop themselves if they want to. Mm -hmm. And I said, now there are special programs in Israel catering for Haredi men and Haredi women as well to come and study in colleges and universities. I think this is extremely important. And therefore, I think that it's, it's good for the university to find compromise in themselves. You know, there's a lot of outcry among the liberal communities in Israel. Why do we agree that there will be segregation between the Haredi men and the Haredi women. But if we won't agree to that, there won't be anything for them. The result is there won't be any studies for the women. They will stay at home. So if the choice is segregation and providing them the ability to study or no segregation and the women stay at home, mm -hmm. I'm for the former. I would like to, again, I would like to empower women to become what they can become and not to be repressed by halacha, by Jewish law. Right, so, so another issue concerning this men-women equality, uh, you've mentioned in your book the, the struggles of the women of the wall for the recognition of their religious rights pertaining to the prayers at the Western Wall. 
what would you, for, in your opinion, what would be the just and, and reasonable framework that would accommodate the, the interests of the Orthodox Jewry, the different streams of Orthodox Jewry, and also the liberal streams of Judaism at the Western Wall? And maybe to, to make the problem even more problematic, is there a space for the Muslim religious services at the Western Wall of the al Burak Plaza, as the Muslims call it? And on the other side, uh, would you be for the Jew Jewish religious services at the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, in the perception of the Muslims? I started a book with several premises, and I said that um, you need to start with these premises. And if you disagree with the premises, probably you're going to disagree with my conclusion uh, through other books. One of the premises speaks about equality gender equality between men and women. So I believe that women are equal to men. Of mm. course, there are bi biological differences, but in terms of human rights, basic human rights, they're equal. You can't say that one gender is superior to the other. I simply do not accept this uh, because that's another form of racism. And I would not, never condone or advocate any form of racism or chauvinism, which is a form of racism. So the premise is that there is equality between men and women. If there is equality between men and women, and there's some women who would like to pray in the mode that they see fit for themselves, these are orthodox women. And they believe in gender equality. And it's important for them to pray with the talit, with the shawl, and to pray directly from the Torah, um, not by any other book. And they, of course, to pray in the holiest place on earth for the Jews, which is the Western world. And I think that um, liberal democracies or democracies at large, while we don't like to um, resort to cohesion, and if possible, we want to avoid cohesion, there's no problem for democracies to resort time and again to regulation. There's one thing between censorship and then regulation. You know, when you speak, I listen. When I speak, you listen. And we understand that this will enable our conversation. If we both speak at the same time, none of us is going to be understood. And therefore, democracy understand that and will facilitate time for you to speak, time for me to speak, time for him to speak, time for her to speak. So I'm in favor of regulation, meaning that women should be allowed to pray at the Western world not any other place, but in the Western world, because that's the most important place for them. And if some men hurt, are offended by watching women the, reading from the Torah or putting on themselves the shawl or the keeper on the head, well, we should devise time for women to do that when these men are not there. So we we'll say, between this and that hour of certain days, these women would be allowed to pray. You men, we understand that you don't like it. We don't like to offend you. Make your own conclusion whether you like to be at the Western Wall at the time that these women pray. This to me is a just, reasonable compromise that will enable just and reasonable multiculturalism. Exactly the same thing would apply to Muslim because I explained in the first chapter the importance of justice. So I apply the veil of ignorance. And whenever I come to any topic, any subject, and all the application part of the book, of course, all of them are sensitive. All of them are problematic. But the way to come to handle this question, I have to come to Bula Rasa. We are all byproduct, whether we like it or not, of our upbringing, of our families, of our friends, of our educations, of the surroundings, of the environment. If I would like to make an objective, as objective that can be, judgment about anything, I have to be behind the veil of ignorance. So behind the veil of ignorance, I know what does it mean to be a man and a woman. I know what does it mean to be a Jew and an other, other culture, religion. I know what does it mean to be poor and rich. I know what does it mean to be a fool and a genius. I simply don't know where I am in this kind of categorization. 
And therefore, I would opt for equality. This is one of the principle of justice. So for me, this principle of, of equality applies to Muslims, to Christians, to, Jude, to Jews, notwithstanding their religion. So whatever I'm going to say about Jews, I'm going to say about Islam. Now you ask me a different question, what about praying in the Temple Mount? As you may know, according to Allah, Jewish law, Jews are allowed to, temp to pray in the Temple Mount only after the arrival of the Messiah. Well, that's, if that's what they want, we'll wait until the Messiah. Uh, but if you want to precede the Messiah and pray, and this is going to engulf and create a lot of um, titillation, a lot of violence as a result of that and so on, you have to look at the circumstances and the consequences of each of your action. And then you'll do a judgment call. But to poke a person in the eye just for the feeling of poking, I, I don't see the point. The, the, who wants to, to pray in, in the Temple Mount? Religious Jews. Well, if you're religious, then according to your own religion, you'll have to wait until the Messiah comes. Okay, so maybe for a while, let's, let's leave this uh, internal dimension. Uh, of of this multicultural discussions and maybe can you share some thoughts about the international dimension of this of these tensions and do you believe that the, the liberal democracies are obliged to support the values that you are writing about in the book abroad uh, and what would be the the reasonable extent of the pressure that one can one state can put on the other states citing the the issues of human rights and is it even effective in your opinion? Of course. Well, first of all, the, the book is, as I said in, in the introduction, is limited only to democracies or to liberal democracies. I'm saying democracies or liberal democracies because the two case studies that I took, the country case studies, France and Israel, I, for one, don't believe that they are liberal, not in the Anglo-Saxon way. So mm -hmm. it's liberal democracies or democracies. But I don't aspire that this book will ring true to non-democratic countries. Not because I think that the values that I pronounce and promote are wrong in some way or another. It's simply because I'm realistic and know that I can speak forever about women's rights, but you know, it's not going to be very effective in places like Saudi Arabia or Iran. So it's not because I don't believe that women's rights are universal, it's simply because I'm a practical person and I think there are ill-suited for certain governments that are not democratic. But I believe that there are certainly these values, these precepts are true for liberal democracies and for democracies. Yes, I, I don't see any differences between the French or the English or the German when it comes to the application of these values within, within the theory of just reasonable multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. And, and staying with this uh, international dimension, um, there is the, the debate, and you make a strong case against Israel being an apartheid state, uh, pointing at the situation of the Arab citizens uh, in Israel that is very, well, it's very different from the situation of the uh, black community in the South Africa. But there are also some voices in this debate that after the over 50 years of Israeli control over the West Bank and Gaza, uh, we should treat the entire area of Israel and the Palestinian territories as, as one polity. And in this case, it would deprive the Palestinians living in Gaza and West Bank uh, of the basic human rights. What is your answer to this claim? Well, I, I, I disagree with that. I, I disagree with that because of the simple reason. In Israel, not the occupied territories, in Israel, there is a law. And everyone is supposed to be equal before the law. At least the euro, if not the factor. As you know, in the occupied territories, and to be more specific, just to make sure that we understand each other, in the West Bank. Because in Gaza, the situation is different. There's, there are no Jews in Gaza, as you know. There are many Jews outside of Gaza, but inside Gaza, there's no, there's no one Jew, well, part of the three prisoners that Hamas is holding there as, as cars. Uh, so I'm talking about the West Bank. In West Bank, there's no Israeli law. 
there's martial law, there's a military law. So the Israeli law is, is lacking in, in the West Bank, unfortunately. The only resort that they have, the only recourse to justice they have is the appeal directly to the Supreme Court as acting as the High Court of Justice. But of course, the laws of Israel do not apply in the occupied territories. And I, for one, do not think that the majority, I'm not sure even the mi minority, but certainly not the majority of Israeli Arabs would like to be associated with the West Bank. I mean, if you would tell them, okay, we are now moving the border, the Gin line, and the small triangle that there's a lot of uh, Israeli arms within a small triangle, from now on will be part of the future Palestine. I'm not sure that the majority of the Palestinians will be delighted by this option. I think many of them uh, would oppose such a proposition because for better and worse, they enjoy the fact that they are living in Israel. So to say there's only one community, the Palestinian community, even the Palestinians do not believe in that. But going to the point of apartheid, those who claim that Israel is a part state either are not familiar with the meaning of apartheid, never been to South Africa, never read about South Africa, or know very little about Israel. Because there's no one law for the Arab and one law for the Jew in Israel. It's the same law. In apartheid state, the racism was explicit in your face, based in the constitution of the country. You look at the basic laws of Israel, you look at the consortium of law, Israel doesn't have a written constitution as such, but all the basic laws and all what, what makes Israeli law, you can see that there's no one law for the Arab and one law for the Jew. I'm not saying there's no discrimination. I claim there is discrimination that should be repaired and should be redeemed. I'm saying this quite clearly in the chapter. But when discrimination is exercised, it is always implicit. Nobody say, I'm not going to rent you an apartment because you are an Arab. Because if you say that explicitly, you can be sued and you are going to lose in the court. You cannot do that. Now, there's other ways to discriminate, but they must be implicit. They're outside of the law. So therefore, Israel is not an apartheid state. The case, unfortunately, is very, very different in the West Bank. Because there you see there is one law for the settlers, the Jewish settlers. Because according to them, the Israeli law does apply. But again, for the Arabs, they live under military law. So we have two very different laws for the same territory, depending on the religion or the nationality of the people. And this is apartheid. And therefore, you, you see that the way of life of the settlers, the quality of life, the standard of living of the settlers, is very, very different than uh, if you compared any of these parameters to the Palestinians in, in the West Bank. Very, very different. So yes, there's a part that unfortunately in the West Bank, but it doesn't infiltrate into Israel. Now, I'm not saying that there's no effect of the West Bank on Israel. I think there is an effect on Israel. I think that it's, it's undermining Israel democracy. I think that this thinking that you put an 18 years old boy, give him a gun and say, now you are going to protect law and order in the West Bank according to military law, make him into a brute and think that six days of the week he is going to be a brute, then coming home and he is going to be just a civil nice man. Well, it simply doesn't happen. And we see the rise of level of violence in Israel uh, as a result, I think, of the occupation, at least one of the factors of the occupation. So I think that the occupation infiltrates illiberalism and um, values that are anti-democratic, discrimination against Arabs inside Israel. And this, I'm really sorry about this, and that, therefore I'm always saying Israel should strive to finish this occupation, to withdraw from the West Bank. Of course, first and foremost, for the sake of the Palestinians, because they ache under the occupation, they have to endure the occupation each and every day, and I would not like to live one day of my life under occupation, but also for the sake of Israel, because the values, so-called values of the occupation, infiltrate into Israeli democracy and undermine Israel democracy. 
and none of us really want this. Hmm. All right, maybe uh, let's go to more general questions about your book and all the issues that you mentioned, all the case studies are very contentious and, and they're part of the public debate and they evoke a lot of sentiments, but maybe you have some part of the book, some issues, a case study that was the, the most difficult for you. As you said, the, the, the old side of the application is, is very, very difficult. The most difficult chapter for me to write was the chapter on male circumcision. And I decided to write about male circumcision quite late in the game. I told you that I began to think and write uh, the book in 2011, very mm -hmm. slowly. I was preoccupied with other things. I published another book, big book about the internet in 2015. So it was not my only project. It was on a low burner project um, for 10 years. And then in the last year, this is when push come to Fashav and I did a, the heavy lifting of the writing. For about nine years of the project, I was reluctant to write about male circumcision. I did not want to enter into this territory. And what persuaded me, um, Cambridge, before public, before accepting the manuscript, they sent the manuscript to five reviewers. Mm. And I think two of them said in their critique, why does the author deal with female circumcision and he doesn't deal with male circumcision? He should do that. And uh, another thing that I do, before I publish any major work in my life, I always send it to a group of friends of mine whose opinion I appreciate. And several of them said, Rafi, you should tackle also male circumcision. So because these people prompted me, I actually added another chapter. This chapter of male circumcision was, was late in the game and was added. And it was a very complicated chapter because as a Jew, I understand the importance of male circumcision for my religion and for my tradition. I can also tell you that as a father of two boys, I also have a daughter, but she didn't have to endure neither male circumcision nor female circumcision. So she was exempted. But for my two boys, I can tell you that for my wife and myself, it was not easy that day of the circumcision. We were very conflicted about this and decided at the end to do that, but it was not wholeheartedly. Because I think that the issue of um, protecting the vulnerable is very important to me. It's part of my psyche, part of who I am. I will always stand for the underdog. I will stand for those who are discriminated against, against injustice. And here, there's a clear clash between tradition and the rights of the newborns. And someone has to protect their rights. And because the parents collaborate with male circumcision, then it should be another person or another entity that should defend the rights of, of the newborns. And when I studied, started my research, I saw that the, the WHO, the uh, World Health Organization, says very, very clearly that in order to tackle the issue of pain of the newborn, you have to apply injections anesthesia through injections. The problem is that halacha, Jewish law, opposes to injections. And I was corresponding and consulting very important rabbis, and, and they told me, Rafi, listen, if you insist on anesthesia by injections, you're going to alienate all the orthodoxy. That's something I didn't want to do. So for me, this was a major obstacle. What should I do? How can I find a way, a balancing way, you know, compromise the middle ground between Jewish law and protecting the rights of the vulnerable of the newborns. And it took me some time and I consulted imams and rabbis and doctors and physicians and uh, experts on anesthesia and uh, circumcisers, anyone around uh, the, the newborn's bed, if you like, on the eve of circumcision, consulting with them. 
And at the end of the day, I was able to devise a proposal. So um, I'm not going to mention the proposal here. Let's say you, you need to read the book in order to, you know, I know that you read the book, so you know the proposal. But uh, if you are really interested to know uh, what is the way forward that I devised, you need to, um, to read the book. But I can tell you that I found a middle ground between orthodoxy and liberalism a way that I think is just and reasonable and that would allow multiculturalism to, to flourish without offending Allah. But it was, it was really, really difficult. For months, I, was, I had sleepless nights because I didn't know how to break this conundrum. I, I was, what should I do? How can I find a way out? Until I found. And um, you know, if you look hard, you'll be able to find. And I looked very, very hard to find it. And I had many, many sleepless nights. It took me about six months to find a way out of this uh, thing. So this was the major problem that I tackled in, the, in writing the book. That was, for, the, for me, the most complex and the most troubling chapter. I don't think that it convinced 100% of the population, but I think that it is able to convince many Orthodox. I spoke with many Orthodox people, and they accepted my proposal. So be sorry. I mean, I am very pleased with that, with the result. Do you remember a particular Eureka moment when you understood what is the, the answer to this problem or it yeah. develops? To the, yeah. Yes, I had, I had, I'd, I, I interviewed their discussions with dozens of people. And the first came with um, a physician, a Muslim physician um, who practiced, he was the head of his. Uh, ward, uh, neonatal ward, in the largest hospital in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and then in hospital in England. Very experienced man. When I talked to him, he was always the retired, but with vast amount of experience. And he gave me the first hints where can we find the compromise? Because his view as a as a Muslim believer was very, very close to the views of Orthodox uh, sages or rabbis. Mm -hmm. So he was the first to go, who brought me an opener. And then I was lucky to speak to the former president of the World Medical Association, whose profession is anesthesia. And he gave me a way out of this conundrum as well. So Together, these two people, although I don't think they know each other, they provided the first way for me to step forward. And then I did more research about whatever they prescribed and, and told me, and I was able to find a way out. So it was really thanks to this um, Muslim doctor and the Jewish doctor that I was able to find the way out. And both of them are experts in the fields and do the circumcision themselves. So they were the perfect people to ask. and. Uh, I was very pleased with them. And of course, I thank them in the book. Can you share any more of the interesting moments in the course of your research or most surprising moments in your research? Well, this was clearly the Amish. Uh, the, this chapter was the, you know, sometimes you do research on one thing and you do the research. Um, and, um, you know, I'm a person who, who, who don't stick the arrow and then draw the circle. I do the research, I go to circles, and when I get a conclusion, I stick the arrow. That's how I work. So when I start writing something, I'm not sure what the result uh, is going to be. And I can tell you that I changed my mind uh, in this book, in other books that I've written. It's not just something I can, that's what I'm going to decide beforehand. So when I came to study the issue of the Amish, um, I, I said to myself, we need to, reconcile, we have to find a balance, a balancing act between the rights of the Amish to protect themselves, to protect their religion and to maintain themselves, I fully appreciate that, and the rights of the children. And in order to find a way, I said to myself as a researcher, okay, so the Amish limit the rights of their own children because they want to perpetuate their own religion, their own culture, the agriculture of, of, of the community. 
and they stop the education by the age of 16. And until the age of 16, uh, they provide very basic education compared to the American. What happens to children who decide to leave the community? What happens to them? To what extent they are able to integrate in society? Because the Supreme Court said in Yoder, in this president, president that I'm quoting, it says that um, there's no evidence that Amish boys or girls that want to leave the community are unable later to do that. And I questioned that. I said, okay, let's see. So I read everything I could put my hands on that was published by former Amish. Most of them were girls or young women who wrote these books or articles about their experience as Amish. And now they become Americans. Now they're part of the American community. And I started to read the books. And this came to me as a surprise because I didn't expect them to say what they said. I expected them to say, to speak about hardship of integrating into American society, but all of them, not 90%, not 95%, all of these women who wrote the books spoke about sexual abuse in the Amish community, spoke about incest, rape, by people who are very close to them, or people who have authority over them. So they spoke about incest and rape by their fathers, by their brothers, by their uncles, by the bishops. And, you know, they, this came to me as a dilemma. What should I do with this kind of information? Because I didn't, my intention was not to write about child abuse. That's not the topic, topic of my uh, book. The topic of my book is about multiculturalism and how to reconcile it with liberalism. It's not about incest, it's not about rape. But the phenomenon was so great that I decided then I cannot ignore that. And this gave an extra layer of argumentation why the state should interfere when it comes to close communities like this. Of course, the Amish are not alone in practicing such phenomena in the world, because if you look at the Haredi, for instance, you find it very, very similar. You look at the Catholic Church, you find very similar phenomena. You look at the kibbutzim in Israel in the 1950s, you find very similar phenomena. Every time that you have a close community that is not respected, that is not regulated, that the state stops and says, okay, we understand you're autonomous, we don't like to intervene, you'll find this kind of phenomena. But it's very important to understand that if you decide to do such a thing, there are going to be consequences. So the fact that the Amish grow up and know nothing about sex, they don't have any sexual education, they don't even know how to name their organs, their own organs, they don't even know how to appreciate whether what their father is doing to them is right or wrong. They just feel awkward about this. This is wrong. And they have nowhere to appeal uh, because to whom do they can appeal? They're going to appeal to the uncle. Well, he's, he can abuse them as well. To the bishop, he can abuse them as well. And, and the Amish protect the abusers and not provide enough protection for the young boys and girls. It's also boys that are being attacked. So it, it's, it gives you another incentive, another rationale why the state should intervene in the Amish community and other communities that are close, closely knit and safeguard themselves. We have to make sure there is no abuse. And it's again, part and parcel of being a democratic society that we have our duty to protect the vulnerable. And here there's a duty to protect the, the, ch the children. So for me, it, reading about the Amish was surprising. I didn't expect this to happen. And I can tell you that I wrote this chapter in two formats. I, I read the, I, I wrote one, the same chapter without mentioning abuse and sexual abuse, just focusing on the issue of cultural and religion. And another chapter that integrate also the issue of, of incest and child abuse and rape and so on. And I consulted some of my colleagues and friends and said, should I mention this? And all of them said, without any exception, this is too important. This elephant in the room is too important to be left out. You must address it. I know that it was not your intention to write about this, but reality forces you to write about this. So you have to write about this. This was my surprise in writing the book. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. 
Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of the uh, interview, and I want to come back to the issue uh, that you've mentioned at the beginning, uh, David Cameron and his speech about the multiculturalism. And in your book also, you've mentioned other politicians from European Union uh, revoking their earlier support for the idea of multiculturalism. So what is your assessment of the condition of multicultural democracies in the Western world today? Do you have any hope for us, optimism at the end of the interview? First of all, I'm always optimistic. Um, you have to. I mean, people without hope, <laughs> they're going to be very miserable people. So I'm always optimistic. I'm not ignoring the problems. There are many problems. And I did not attempt in one book to tackle all the problems there are. There are many problems I didn't touch about. There's that much that you can do in, I don't know how many pages, 300 pages or 400 pages of the book. Uh, but, you know, I tackled enough and uh, provided enough insights and prescription to delineate the boundaries of interference, striking a balance between individual rights and group rights, standing for the rights of women and children, preaching for the duty and obligation of democracies to intervene when there is injustice and discrimination and when the practices are unreasonable. So I think there's enough there to digest and to follow and to promote when you tackle other issues. There's not never going to be a perfect society. There's not going to be ever um, a society that is immune to conflicts and divisions and schisms. There are always going to be frictions. What we need to do is to find ways to mitigate these frictions, to build the bridges. And I think that I provided enough with the theory and the application to show that creating bridges is possible, is part of the reality, but of course you need to want this to happen. If you think that multiculturalism is a problem and you don't want to build the bridges, but you want to be the bull in the China shop and to go in your own way, notwithstanding other cultures, you are going to destroy it. And I think it's going to be a very dull world if all of us will have exactly the same dress exactly the same food, exactly the same religion, exactly the same uh, language, exactly the same songs, exactly the same festival. God, it's going to be so boring. I don't want to live in such a world. I enjoy and relish the mosaic of multiculturalism. I think it's beautiful. All this variety of smell, of colors, of dresses, of food. I relished it. I think it's important. And I think that we need to find a fora for each and every one of us to be what he, she wants to be and not to ask to stifle them. For me, that's a starting point. So I think multiculturalism is a plus. It's not negative. It's beautiful. And we need to cherish and relish that. And if you come from this kind of perspective, you will be able as a leader of community to build the bridges because you appreciate what it comes with. You don't want to live in a dull, coercive world. So that's my point. And I think that it is possible, it is doable. Yes, we have hope and we have appreciation and we have what it takes to do that. We can build the bridges. So yes, we can see the light. Thank you. Thank you so much for this positive note at the end. And, and thank you for, for this fascinating discussion and that you accepted our invitation to talk about your book. Uh, and, and I strongly recommend that the book, once again, Just Reasonable Multiculturalists, published by the Cambridge University Press this year, to all our viewers and subscribers, and both as an introduction to the theory of multiculturalism and a strong voice in the public debate on these contentious issues. All of these case studies are contentious in the contemporary debate, also in Israel. So once again, very, very thank you very much for, for your being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, Arthur. Appreciate that. Good night. And good night and see you in the next episodes of our interviews. Thank you.